Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Ollie Horn. And joining us this week is David A. McNeil, author, communications professor, and a formerly correspondent for The Economist, The Independent, and The Irish Times, where he got his start reviewing the River Shannon Lockern cruise routes. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And、um, I've never been on that cruise, but it sounds very slow. On this week's show, a kawabune is a Japanese vessel made of wood. Kawa means river and fune means boat. But it's also a way of thinking about man's spiritual connection with nature, a way of finding joy in the day to day of water based transportation, and a reason to ask ourselves and David deeper questions about why there's so much Orientalist bullshit in Western reporting on mundane Japanese stuff. Plus, Ali's got your weekly river cruise recommendation. Ali? Yes, Bobby, I would part ways with your view that that is a mundane word.、Uh, this week's recommendation, Bobby,、uh, is based around the fact that there has never been a better time to recommend the annual April Fool's Day Dotonbori cruise that's run by an Osaka based collective of international prank artists. Now, this year they've added an extra three trips to try and earn as much money as possible this year in order to pay off the compensatory damages they're liable for after their highly successful Suez Canal prank last week. Also, everything continues to look good on the Olympic preparation front. All of the Tokyo area river cruise boats that are scheduled to participate in the opening ceremony waterway parade have been fully sanitized from stem to stern. And COVID 19 infections among the crew have been standing at zero ever since they stopped conducting PCR tests. Later in the show, we'll take a look at the exact number of international COVID variants we can expect to see present in the Summer Games. But first, soap d o p Hey, Brian, you got anything for Soap Talk this week? No. It has occurred to me that not every week we explain to our guest what Soap Talk means. And, it's, and there might now be listeners、yes. that don't know what Soap Talk means. And it's always embarrassing when I have to explain, oh, yeah, Bobby bullied me because I got it wrong once. <laughs> and now it's become a thing. <laughs> you were、uh, in on the joke. Yeah. But also, but also, what I found funny this week was when I was explaining to David, oh, yes, we have our Soap Talk section. And I said it so naturally now as if like, that's now part of the. English lexicon, I was almost offended when David went, Oh, so the sausage talk, or how, whatever, whatever you got it wrong.、Uh, I was like, How dare you? Are you what are you, stupid?、Uh, obviously, it's soap talk. That's what you say in English. That is a better description of what it originated as.、Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so this originated in a blooper, right? Yeah. In a、mm. slip of the tongue. You made, you made a mistake. And it was Sekken. Sekken b a n a s h i Sekken. I, I was supposed to say Sekken b a n a s h i But I said Sekken Banashi, and Bobby's going to say, Oh, they sound the same. <laughs> well, these are really common、uh, slips of the tongue because there are so many similar sounding words in Japanese. And David, you and Ali have、mm. both written about these kinds of slips of the tongue. You in the form of a great piece for the Japan Times, Ali in the form of、uh, jokes of debatable quality.、Um, let's talk about your piece to start. And let's not have that debate. If we must. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, what I did was so I was、uh, one day I was、uh, trying to put up a curtain、uh, in my apartment and I used the word、uh, negi instead of neji.、Ah. Uh, you guys, being fluent Japanese speakers, will know that I had,、uh, it, instead of saying I had tried to put in a, with a nail, I had used、uh, a spring onion. Right, right. <laughs> and my wife, my wife doubled over with laughter. And I, I just realized that I, The whole time I've been in Japan, I've been making people laugh with my Japanese.、Mm. So I might as well <clears throat> make some money out of it. So I, I wrote an article and then I contacted all my journalist friends and asked them, Can you give me your best bloopers?、Uh, and、uh, they sent them in kindly. So that's really what the article is about.、Um, I, I feel like I、um, probably took first prize because I was on a radio、mm. show in 2000.、Uh, it was a live radio show. We were interviewing. A woman <clears throat> who was an amateur historian. She was in her 60s. And my job was, my, my Japanese wife at the time was the lead anchor. My job was to be the kind of gaijin foil, to be the comic relief, and to just tag along.、Um, so what I said was at one point, Ja, anato wa no, sono, sensei no shikoto yamete shofu ni narimashita desho ne, which means, so you、mm. gave up your teaching job to become a、right. prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole studio kind of froze. And I remember the director who was sitting on the other side of this big mirror, he kind of jumped out of his seat like he'd been、uh, shocked. So, you know, like literally a foot off his chair. So I, so I realized I'd done something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. So then I said it really slowly again. <laughs> so you stopped being a teacher and you became a prostitute. <laughs> and my wife, who is 
really used to my bloopers, kind of said, Davey, もしかしたら、主婦じゃない、right? Do you mean a housewife? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. But at that point, the damage <laughs> yeah. was done, you know. <clears throat> at that point, you should have just doubled down. Why not both? <laughs> <laughs> or, or run out of the studio and never, never gone back, you know. One of my favorite ones, and this is another one that I did on air and I got in a lot of trouble for it.、Um, people always want to want to ask about international marriages and the differences between culture, between, you know, a、uh, uh, Western. Partner and their Japanese partner, and somebody was asking me about the differences, the bunka no chigai, the cultural differences between myself、mm. and my wife. And one of my go to responses、mm. is always that, you know, we, we have a lot of differences that I would consider more gender differences. Like that's where a lot of our issues come from. And I wanted to talk about a really benign one and say that she's cold all the time. And the word for somebody who's cold all the time is hie sho, hie meaning to, to like to cool down, <laughs> hie sho. And This is not that similar of a Japanese word, but the intonation always makes me confuse the two of them. I confused it with Jihei Sho, which is autism. <laughs> so, what I said in the studio was,、uh, was about how it was more about the difference between men and women. You know, my wife was really autistic and she was always stealing my blanket at night. But when I think about it, you know, that's not a cultural thing. My ex girlfriend was autistic and used to steal my blanket too. And most of the women I know <laughs> seem pretty autistic to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And I could see everybody、Whoa. because the Japanese person on the other end of this、uh, often has no idea where the mistake is coming from. Where the mistake is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so people say these things to you, and then you.、Um, you the other thing that was in, in, interesting in Japan is people don't sometimes, they, because they don't want to offend you, they don't say,、eh, no, you don't know,、right. what are you talking about? You obviously made a mistake. They'll just go, Ah, so this guy, another whole world, right? <laughs> assuming that you, you know, assuming right, that you right, really, right, your wife right, really right. is autistic, right? right? So you're, you're in that hardware store trying to hammer that leak in with a carrot. It's like, just leave him. He'll, he'll learn for himself. <laughs> well, that's the great thing about Japan. People will say, well, whatever, you know. Yeah, that, you do you. It's up to you. You do you. Well, talking of you do you, we, we ought to、uh, talk about the listeners, which have done them by. Very kindly supporting the show by buying us coffees. Natasha once again has bought us a coffee.、Uh, it's becoming a bit of a routine. If only she would turn that routine into a regular subscription、uh, as a member.、Uh, but、uh, Natasha, thanks very much. Glad to hear you're enjoying the show. And also, AD underscore M underscore U bought us five coffees,、uh, saying, Great podcast, full stop. Then continuing with, But I wish you'd let your guests speak more. The worst is when you interrupt them for a cheap joke, disrupting their flow. And then he gives a transcript, which is guest, colon, my interesting opinion, colon,、uh, Ollie, cheap joke, boom, guest, ha ha ha. Bobby, this is what I think, don't you? Question mark, guest, especially if Japanese, yes. <laughs> Bobby, do you want to take this one? Yeah.、Um, yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you for caring enough about the show to send in your constructive criticism along with a handful of cash. To be honest, I'm pretty sure I caused this because I did say last week you can send in, you can say anything you like as long as it's accompanied by money. And so I, I'm kind of glad that worked. It, it shows that they care about the show. And I, and I do think that it's actually a totally valid criticism.、Um, it's come up before,、uh, just between Ali and I. And I think it's one of the main things that we could improve on in terms of how we host the show. And we don't want to like double down on this mistake and make a long thing out of this instead of talking to David. <laughs> so if you're interested in hearing us talk about this specifically in terms of what our goals are、uh, when we put together a guest conversation and what it takes to try to get the balance we're aiming for, we're going to record one and put it out as an extra. So that would be、uh, a great. Extra you could get if you sign up as a monthly member. Yeah, that's $5 a month for early access to the show, bonus bits every week, and a free ride on our boat when we can finally afford one. But just so, so、uh, we can prove that this isn't a weird gimmick,、uh, if you don't feel like <laughs> subscribing to hear that, we will make this specific extra free and, and link it to our Twitter so you can listen to it. For, for, for the first time in the、uh, show's history, Adam's twisted our arm to not do some kind of gimmick. Um, I also should thank Adam for at least including the guest laughing at my cheap jokes in the transcript. That felt great.、Uh, anyway, with that, we will. We'll genuinely record that. I think it's going to be interesting, and I think some people、uh, might want to hear it. So, with that, let's take a look at the news. The Mainichi Shimbun reports Japanese government employee to be paid compensation for harassment by an official in the anti harassment department. The harassment in question has been roundly condemned by other Japanese government officials, including almost all of the men in the Ministry of Women's Empowerment. Our own JBRC Press Club correspondents have followed up on the story. Yes, at Kamayama 100 reports that there seems to have been some understandable confusion on the part of the official because he had just recently been transferred from the harassment department. 
and correspondent at PJOMC will be going even further in depth with the release of their book, Harasumento, the ancient Japanese art of showing who's boss. If you'd like to join the JBRC Press Club, follow us at, at JBRC Pod for next week's assignment. David, you recently wrote an article for the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan's paper explaining why you think there's yep. so much bullshit written about Japan in the Western media. I'm summarizing. I don't think you use that word. And uh, it's funny that just last week, the New York Times magazine managed to exoticize and romanticize and orientalize a pot. And uh, this was like widely derided on Twitter. But it seems, it just seems that derision on Twitter is not enough to make it stop. So... My question to you is, you've covered the history of Western media getting Japan wrong. Is it ever going to stop? Well, not only have I covered the history of the Western media getting it wrong, but I've been part of the problem uh, in the sense That's that the I first worked step. for... Yes. So the first, yeah, it's a 12-step program. And the first, pro the first step is recognizing that you have a mm -hmm. problem, which I have. Uh, so I worked for a British newspaper called The Independent for 16 years. And a staple of... My uh, job, if you like, was a late evening call, actually sometimes as late as we are now, 10 o'clock at night, but usually after the conference in London, uh, an editor would call and he'd say, David, we've seen um, this new geisha movie uh, coming out and we're wondering if you could interview a geisha uh, uh, and could you do it now or do it tonight? And I would say, <laughs> well, do you know how hard it is to get a geisha interview? And I would say, well, just put it together from what you can find on the wires. And those would be quite regular uh, requests, you know, for this kind of hardy perennials. We call them hardy perennials in, in uh, journalistic speak. So geisha, uh, sumo, sexless marriages, <clears throat> um, uh, anything to do really with quirky or weird sex. Um, uh, Yakuza, of course, was another one. So, and whaling was a regular one in the British media. So these are th these are the things that you said you call them hardy perennials. I think now they might be more akin to like searchable keywords. Yeah, I mean, if you so they're clickbait. I mean, they, and eventually they became clickbait in the sense that um, you know what would happen is if you wrote a story about a sexist marriage or Japan's barbaric whaling practices or whatever it was, then you could guarantee that that article would go into the top 10 uh, of the most read articles for that particular day, which is why editors would call you up. So, you know, just, just to take their position for a minute, <clears throat> the editor's position, that is, uh, they, they were, uh, you know, putting together a newspaper with a very small budget. And in, in the independence case, it was, it was always teetering on the verge of bankruptcy mm. as well, uh, basically, since it was set up. Certainly since I, t I came to the paper, which is 2001. You've established that it's not your fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it was my fault, but uh, probably I paid a part. But uh, no, they weren't paying me enough to, to, make, to, make, to make me part of the bankruptcy problem. But, but what they would try and do is they would try and leaven the mix of war, famine, catastrophe, Donald Trump, whatever it was, you know, all the crap going on in the world with a bit of light relief mm. from Japan or Korea. And I was writing for both countries. And that meant co what we call color stories. Um, so you you were always sort of asked to pull these things out of the out of the bag, you know. And and sometimes it was really really uh, you know you kind of you balked right because the stories were so mm. stupid. Like I remember before I came to Japan, there were so many stories in the British press about how cruel Japanese people were to animals, mm. um, and you know how they mistreated them. And then when I came here. Uh, one of the first things I was asked to do was a 2,000 word feature on how Japanese people are, love animals. And not only do they love them, but they're using animals to replace their desire to have children. So they're stopping having children, they're having dogs and cats. And I was asked to put that together in, in a sort of very short space of time, you know, three or four hours. So you can't even get any interviews, you can't put any context, you can't put any nuance. You just end up saying Japanese people love their pets. Uh, because they're not having any babies, you know. That, that, that seems like one of these, like, bingo cards where you've, you've managed to check off, like, three or four. You've got, like, a little hiki, hikikomori element. You've got a cute Japan element. Kawaii, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting because one of the most, probably the most trolled I've ever been in my life was when I did an article on AKB48, which, of course, is a uh, kawaii pop group. Mm. And, and I couldn't, I just couldn't resist taking the piss, you know, out of, out of the whole sort of um, kawaii phenomenon and, you know, going to this concert and I was not the oldest person there and 95% of the people who were there were 
were men, mm. right? So the whole, it just seems saturated in kind of pedophilia or pe- pedophilia light to me at least. And that's the way I wrote it up. But the trolling I got was was unbelievable. People saying, you you know, you're dissing Japanese culture. You you, you don't understand it. You don't respect it. Um, uh, and, and one of the reasons why they said that is because <clears throat> it's very hard in, in a, you know, 700 words, 800 words, whatever the newspapers give you to to really set up complex issues like that you know right. you, like, you only kind of touch on the surface um and and you never really get to grips with with uh with you know stuff like pedophilia for example or that element in japanese culture and how common is it for a newspaper to come to you with basically the thesis of the story already and say this is what we're looking for as you just described often is, is the answer to that because they've seen the story somewhere else right so they've seen japan's pet boom or they've seen a new geisha movie and of course in 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 the particular incident of the independent, it was always middle aged editors who'd grown up without any experience of Japan. They'd never been to Japan, and in some cases, or in many cases, their only experience of Japan was either the war, the memory of the war, mm-hmm. right? So you had the kind of whole barbaric Japanese syndrome, and then you had war comics. I mean, I grew up reading Japanese war comics. You know, all those the the sturdy British Tommy mowing down, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, lines and lines of. Japanese soldiers who would only ever say Ay! Mm-hmm. that was the only thing they ever said right so you had that kind of generation and then you had the sort of um, the economic juggernaut which was the dominant narrative in the 80s and 90s so they carried all that framework in their heads when they commissioned these stories from you something that, that really upset me when I, I worked briefly for local Japanese television and one time I was sent on an assignment where I would randomly speak to people on the street pretending I was a tourist and then seeing how they would react and, you know, seeing the le- their level of English. And I remember the first time, the very first thing we shot, I spoke to someone and they responded in fluent English. They were super pleased to meet me. You know, they were, they, they really bought into it. They wanted to become my friend. And uh, I had a great interaction with them. And then as soon as they left and they signed the release, the director basically said, Zanen, which is like, mm. what a shame we can't use that. Can and, and that was like yeah, my yeah. first uh, real world experience of, uh, being a hammer in search of a nail or rather like having having the outcome and not being a journalist and it seems that what you're saying yeah. is that it, it the stories aren't guided by foreign journalists picking up information and constructing a story but rather there's this idea of what japan needs to be in order for our readers to accept it and to engage with it and you just need to find enough pieces that that fit that mold so you're not really being asked to lie you're just being asked to kind of put your blinkers on well, I mean, I think it's both, you know, I think you have all those elements. So uh, let's put let's put it this way. If a correspondent is powerful enough, if they have enough uh, heft and if they're a staffer, then they can argue with a line that the editor has put mm. to them. Right. And they will say, well, look, OK, yeah, it's true that there are robots in Japan. But I'm afraid, you know, that, that article that you saw in the Daily Mail about robots serving people uh, booze or having sex with customers in Osaka, that's completely wrong. That's just false. And I, but I will write you a good article on robots, mm. right? Uh, you know, which might not be as sexy as that. It might be all about how robots now run all of Japan's factories, mm. which is true, right? So, so I, I think it's both. I think, it, you know, I think that the uh, editors come to the journalist, the correspondent on the ground with a framework for understanding Japan. In some cases, the journalists themselves will arrive with a, a set sort of, uh, you know, a mindset of how to cover the country. Um, but then when it clashes with reality, mm. if they're good journalists, they'll change their mindset, right? And they'll argue with the editor. One of the issues I took up in my piece is the fact that because journalism is collapsing or old school journalism is collapsing, you know, that advertiser supported right. model, newspapers and so on, that the industry now is full of uh, people who are stringers, people who are uh, not on contracts and who are just trying to survive. Mm. And in the worst case, not in all case by any means, but in the worst case, cases they those people will write whatever needs to be written right they'll just write what the editor asks because it it's paid 50 cents a word or whatever it is well let's talk about some of the instances where uh the reporter fails or the western media outlet fails um one of the ones that sticks out to me uh, is a story i heard about from a woman i rented to pretend to be my wife uh the family rental business story this was picked up all over uh, Western media, this company in Japan that rented out uh, a family. This was the New Yorker, I believe, right? That's right. So what makes this story... So just to be clear about the context, it wasn't just the New Yorker. Uh, NHK World uh, also did a story mm-hmm. on that. Uh, various other um, 
Western and Japanese outlets. Conan did. O'Brien and did fact, a piece it was on a, it when he was here. Conan O'Brien did a piece, yeah, which I actually used to teach about exoticizing mm. Japan. And it was also the subject of a movie, uh, a documentary movie. So, But the reason why people have focused on The New Yorker is because The New Yorker is a prestigious, one of the kind of, um, you know, Rolls Royce of uh, American publications. And they spend a lot of time and effort fact-checking. And in fact, I know the people who wrote this article. I know the people who were involved in researching it. And there was a lot of, you know, time and effort put into sort of getting to the bottom of this phenomenon, which is the rent-a-family industry, right? So the idea is if you, you go into a wedding or if you need a friend or a, a wife to stand in for you, that you can rent one, right? Um, and it turns out that the, the whole story was kind of undermined because the people who were the sources of the story, the so-called, you know, the actors who were renting were actually um, related. Uh, and they were playing a part not only to the people who that were hiring them, but they were playing a part to the journalist who was writing the story, right? So essentially, the journalist had the wool pulled over uh, over mm. her eyes. And so you're saying the journalist was, was duped, basically. This wasn't an example of the journalist looking for a story, but rather, you know, is there anything the journalist could have done, I guess, is my question. Could even the, the best journalist have, have seen through this? Exactly. It's not a question of, of the journalist deliberately trying to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. It's a question, in this case, particular instance, if the journalist was fooled by her sources, which is very hard, you know, to... So even the, the Japanese fixer in this case, I know, she was suspicious of the story mm-hmm. uh, because it just seemed so weird. But she went ahead with it, right? But I think the bigger issue, this was a piece made by uh, a journalist uh, in uh, a different magazine, The Atlantic, in fact. Um, he said, well... In, in, the issue really is why do editors um, and you know fact checkers, even at the world's most prestigious uh, publications, drop their guard when it comes to Japan? Mm. That's the issue. Yeah. Right? Like, like why is it that you know when you hear a story, you go, really? You know, people are renting families. You know, doesn't that sound weird? So, Elementary school so children are licking accept, eyeballs. Yeah. You. So that's another story, as you know, that ran in the British newspapers that there was this craze for. Japanese, uh, you know, school children licking each other's eyeballs uh, and the story that went all around the world, complete and utter nonsense. So why didn't the editor of the Telegraph, in this case, the first publication, the British Telegraph, the first publication that ran that story, why didn't they say, come on, that's, that's got to be nonsense? They just put the story mm. in. And is, is the answer that if this were the Irish doing the eyeball licking thing, they'd go, Okay, we've re- we've really got to investigate this, but somehow because it's don't you? I don't know. You tell me. Um... They do all kinds of weird things in Ireland. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm making a joke, but I, but I, I think every country has its uh, little sort of cubby holes and its yeah. cultural idiosyncrasies, right? And the Irish are no different, right? But I, you know, why, why, and and of course, the Irish have been exoticized or racialized. Mm. In the British press as well, yes, of right? Course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's lots of lots of stories about the the Irish being thick or the Irish, you know, being being alcoholics or whatever it is. But and some of it is rooted in reality. But the I think you know, if we were just to talk about the Irish case, because there's so much more um, cultural interaction between Ireland and England, right? There's so many more Irish people in England. This, we share the same language. Uh, it's it's much harder to get away with something like that. Japan is um, linguistically, culturally, and so on quite separate and different from other parts of the world and i think that's why you you know it's it's easier for journalists to kind of pull the wool over editors eyes or it's easier easier for editors to pull the wool over journalists eyes right um and the other point sort of to make is it's a very important point by the way is that japan itself plays up its own exoticism and its own difference doesn't it Mm. you know like how many conversations have i had in japan where somebody says you know japan is unique uh, it's got four seasons or, you know, Japanese people have unique, uh, uniquely long guts. Or, yeah. You know, just so many conversations over the years where the Japanese themselves kind of set themselves apart from everybody else, right? Especially older Japanese, not not so much maybe younger Japanese who are more in interaction with the world, but the sort of middle-aged and older cohort, they've just been raised on that idea that we are a separate race of people, right? We are yeah. different. And I think uh, foreign journalists, the bad ones, at least, play up to that, you know. Do you think that times have changed with the proliferation of the internet and the fact that there are lots of other people that can fact check? That the role of the journalist 30 years ago doing this kind of information arbitrage 
is now not as useful because you you tweet one bit of bullshit and you've you've got an army of people going well actually well actually well actually well actually does that inform the work yeah i i think it's a really really good point and i you know i'm fascinated by this whole subject myself i teach it right is like what's happening what is the internet doing to journalism i think it i think to use an old-fashioned word it's dialectic it's not not one thing mm. or the other right i think as you just said if you write something that's false now it's very much harder to get away with it right like uh, when I was starting in journalism, the only comeback that a reader had was to send a letter to the paper and the paper would say, we're not going to print that, right? Then you had all of the comments section, right? The online comments section. And now you've got this vast kind of proliferation of, you know, people on Twitter and so on who can take things apart. And actually, it's quite cruel in some ways because you have sat down, you've had a call from an editor at seven o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night. You put together an article in an hour, Right. And then the article goes out into the world and it's dissected by people who have all the time in the world to spot mm. your mistakes, right? So I, I do think, I'm not going to say that's a good or a bad thing. Sure. Well, I should say in 78 episodes, we've never been fact-checked on any of our River Cruise journalism. So I'm squeaky clean. We stand by it. As far as you know. Uh, <laughs> have you Googled yourself? Uh, Bobby has. Regularly. Regularly. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, you only know how good you are by reading your enemies' comments, right? Yeah. People who don't like you, people who hate you. So even though we do have this kind of like internet fact check machine that kind of uh, makes it a lot easier for the uh, misinformation or the misunderstandings to come to light really, really quickly, we still see this never ending trend for the West to want to orientalize Japan and keep making the same mistakes. Do you think that this says something about the West and what the West wants out of Japan? Well, yeah, I think it says something about the way the West perceives Japan. Um, there is um, a sort of a collective memory of Japan, which certainly from my generation uh, is uncomfortably close to um, stereotypes about mm. the war, about you know, the barbaric Japanese. And I think that it, whaling, for example, to take one case is a sort of a, uh, a stand-in for, you know, that barbarity, right. right? It was a way of writing about mm. Japanese exoticism and so on by not writing about it, right? You could talk about those barbaric Japanese killing whales. Yeah. Um, so I do think it is partly about that. Um, but I do think also uh, there's other factors involved, right? And one of the factors that you might want to, you know, just think a little bit about is journalism itself as a machine for creating artifacts, mm. you know, for creating things that people read, right? Like that's one of the things that was really quite shocking to me because I came to Japan to write about, you know, things that matter, right? But editors, they want to sell the paper for tomorrow and the way that they sell the paper for tomorrow is getting stories that are going to get clicks or reads, yeah. you know? And and that's, that's a big part of it is just the whole kind of um, the fact that the media and commercial, especially newspapers, are commercial enterprises. And there's a feedback loop there as well because people are more inclined to click on things and read things that confirm the narrative or the image that they already have in their head. And it's not just the West that does this to Japan. You can also see the way Japan thinks about other countries based on what kind of media they bring in uh, about other countries. For example... I have never been yeah. on a single news broadcast in Japan that hasn't shown footage of a car crash in China. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, <laughs> I did. Well, there are a lot of car crashes in yeah. China. I used to live there and it was kind of shocking. But, but I, yeah, I mean, just, you know, the bigger issue is the way that the media frames uh, other parts of the world, frames it in every, and, and as we know, the Japanese media is not immune from framing the other, other parts of the world in their own particular way or or just ignoring parts of the world and focusing on other parts you mm. know like so over the years i've been invited on you know shows in japan and there's also been a a a narrative that had already been decided before i'd ever arrived and um, which i sometimes disagreed with but i had zero power to influence you know mm, yeah. like I, I mean one example i would use is the, the Princess Diana was mar was murdered by MI5 uh, narrative. I mean, there have been several programs over the years, and I was interviewed on a TV program about that, and I, I spent, you know, the whole program in my really bad Japanese just saying, you know, Kuro Inbo taking you know, mm -hmm. right? This is a conspiracy theory that it doesn't make any sense. And the only line from what I, my entire interview that was used was, Sonani kantan de wanai. It's not so simple, right? So they just went ahead with their, with their, you know, 
I was the victim of the exact same kind of treatment. I was once on a show with a Japanese journalist who claimed that Japan invented the hand job, and they totally edited out my. No, it did not. <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for listening to this episode 78 of Japan by River Cruise. Monthly members, your bonus bits are in your Dropbox, as always. Thanks to our guest this week, David McNeil. Can we expect to see a return to River Cruise reviews from you in the future? Not River Cruises, no. I hate boats, actually. But um, putting together a book uh, on comparing the Japanese media and the foreign media, which could be quite interesting and could upset a lot of people. So look And please it. come back on the show when it comes out. Uh, we will forgive you for your remark about boats. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week.